this, uh, I mean, keynote session. This is the first event of the day. And we have Professor Matthew Tark as a keynote speaker in this session. And uh, Professor Atik Ahar will be the session chair. So let me introduce Professor Atik Ahar. Uh, Professor Ahar is a senior member of IEEE, senior member of OSA, and professor of University of Dhaka, currently a specially appointed associate professor of Osaka University. He authored 10 books in Springer, published 180 peer reviewed journal. His research interest includes machine learning, computer vision, data science, sensor, and healthcare. Now, without further ado, uh, I will turn the time over to Professor Ahad. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shamim Kaiser. Uh, we have a, a extremely distinguished uh, Professor Methuder. Uh, many of you know him by this time, especially in Bangladesh, because uh, he was the, uh, I mean, he is the founder, uh, the general chair of ICIEV conference, which we started at the University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. And we are extremely grateful to him because, uh, I mean, uh, he's such a big guy and still, uh, I mean, uh, was with us and is still with us for this part. So ICIEV, uh, I mean, with him we started and we thank him very much. He visited Bangladesh once uh, in ICCIT at Deferil International University, Bangladesh. And also uh, some of you met him in Japan when ICIV was held in uh, Kitakyushu once. Uh, but I can see the Dr. Sadia here. She was a student, but now she's a um, PhD and professor. Uh, professor Matthew Turk uh, served in top forums, uh, like the number one conference on computer vision and pattern recognition. So he was a general chair once and uh, automatic face and gesture recognition where I met him basically in Santa Barbara uh, 11, 12 years before. And uh, then we become connected until now we are very, very friend. Uh, I am uh, grateful to him for his guidance and support throughout the uh, year. And uh, he's an IT bully fellow, as well as uh, the fellow of International Association of Pattern Recognition. Uh, one thing is that, I mean, uh, his Google Scholar citation is 43,000, but this not the number is one side, but most important thing is that if you work on uh, recognition or eigenface or this kind of things, you know his work uh, that eigenface uh, for recognition for face recognition and so on. And the, those paper work during his PhD, I mean, just his PhD work has been cited, I counted, it's like, I mean, almost 29,000 times. So it means that uh, what a contributing original idea he produced during his PhD time. And since then he have been uh, he has been serving in different uh, forums. And finally, uh, he is with the Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago. Don't think that it's in Japan. Uh, and he is the president of uh, uh, DTIC. So I think, uh, I mean, I don't need to add uh, further with uh, just only thing is that we are uh, co-editing uh, a, a book on computer vision and applications, the future challenges, uh, together with uh, Richard Hartley from uh, ANU and uh, Dr. Rupert Margo from Qualcomm. So uh, just, uh, uh, I hope that we'll keep in touch and we would like to have uh, Matthew Turk in Bangladesh in the future. So I would like to request Matthew to start your uh, talk. Take your time as long as you want. No problem, we have, I mean, a window. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I'm really happy to be here. I feel like I have a, um, a, a good and special connection to Bangladesh um, uh, for several years now. As you said, I, I uh, have visited once, and hopefully I'll visit again. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful to be speaking to you all today. Um, as, as Professor Ahad said, I, I um, did some work in face recognition long ago. Uh, I haven't done a lot of work in face recognition in recent years, but I've actually become much more interested in sort of societal issues related to this topic. Um, so my goal in this talk here is, is really not to talk about detailed technical things, but to talk kind of broadly about this public discussion uh, related to AI in general and face recognition technologies in particular. So beyond just the technical issues, there aren't going to be any uh, uh, equations or, or math or experiments in this talk. Um, and I'm going to run through a lot of slides quickly to try to just give you a sense of, of several different things. But I'm really kind of focused in things 
um, including bias and fairness in AI and machine learning and face recognition, but then also beyond those things specifically, how they connect to other scholarly studies and other things like government and ethics and, and such. Um, and, and much of what I'm going to say is, is probably uh, US focused in many ways, at least in terms of the details, but I think it all translate, translates very well to things that are going on throughout the world. Um, so let me start in this topic of uh, beyond bias and fairness in face recognition with a few examples of the kinds of things that we're seeing very frequently uh, lately. So here are just a few examples. Um, on the top left here, uh, a piece in the New York Times not too long ago talking about the racist history behind facial recognition. And then you see other pictures here from demonstrations that are basically anti face recognition technology and something down on the left about stopping face recognition use on uh, college campuses. And these are just a, a, you know, a very small sample of a few things. Uh, discussion about face recognition technologies is everywhere today in, in the media, in among privacy advocates, civil libertarian circles, legislative bodies at all different levels scholars in, in the arts and humanities and social sciences, and of course, researchers and, and engineers in technical areas. But it's really hard to turn on the news or open a newspaper these days, and or especially go to like an AI conference without seeing something about the dangers of AI or, or specifically face recognition technologies. Um, and so it sort of seems like the, the key question these days is, this next slide, the blue circle here, who thought it was a good idea to have face recognition technology? I mean, in a sense, there's so much energy and discussion about dangers and negatives that it's kind of worth stopping and, and like this report from the uh, Brookings Institution asked, why, why do this in the first place? You know, what got people interested in it uh, historically and, and more recently? Um, I have worked in face recognition on and off for over 30 years, uh, 30 plus years ago when I started doing it, I thought it was a pretty good idea. I thought there could be some really interesting applications of it. And in fact, I still do. Um, and so let's start with that. Let's start with just to be clear, some of the positive motivations for automatic face recognition. So here are just some examples of, of useful applications, things like secure access to buildings and locations, transaction security, organizing photos, unlocking your, your cell phone, uh, border security, aids for visual, visually impaired, and, and lots of things uh, of, of various size, you know, little things, medium sized things, and, and even some very large things. And here's an example of something that I would call very large in terms of significance. Um, people have used face recognition technologies to reunite missing and trafficked children with their families to be able to locate, identify children who have been taken and, and lost. Um, and here's an example of this being used in New Delhi uh, a year or two ago and identifying thousands of miss missing children in just days. And there are other examples like this um, around the world. There's also lots of use of face recognition technologies or interest in use in, whoops, excuse me, in law enforcement agencies uh, to, you know, try to find criminals and, and to help solve situations regarding terrorism, murder, kidnapping, child abuse, sex trafficking, battery theft, and other sorts of things. Um, many terrorists and criminals and persons of interest have been found using Interpol's facial recognition system. Uh, by a few years ago and, and many more by today. Um, and also importantly to think about, face recognition is not just used in these scenarios to, to sort of catch the bad guys, but also to actually clear suspects who are not the bad guys, people who might've been detained or, or are sus 
or uh, suspects or something to be able to say with some high degree of certainty, actually, they're not a suspect. So, so let's not, um, you know, disrupt their lives and such. So, so there, there are, you know, both good and bad things going on, but, but there is a lot of positive. And uh, I started with the New York Times article in the last slide, but, but here's a New York Times or just a screenshot of a New York Times opinion piece uh, a, a couple of years ago from the former New York City police commissioner who is saying from his perspective as you know someone who's very much in the thick of lots of kinds of investigations how a technology like facial recognition can really improve things can really make things safer for citizens so um, it's interesting I think to balance a, a lot of the things we hear uh, nowadays with with negative views of facial recognition recognition, which I think are important, and I'll talk about those, but also with the positives and, and with the opportunities. So given that, we, we can go back to this question again of why do automatic face recognition? And again, there, there are lots of different answers to that, all kinds of applications and, and utility for it, from very small things to larger things, and again, police departments and, and things like that. So, so I think there's a lot of potential value. I'd like to go back to you know 30 plus years ago when researchers first started thinking about some of these questions, um, why did why did we at the time um, think a lot about face recognition and think it would be a worth thing doing, a worth thing to do? Uh, a lot of it was frankly curiosity that uh, years ago, people working in AI and computer vision um, thought, well, recognizing faces would be a challenging problem. And that seems to be something that humans do and maybe other biological systems do. Maybe it's important in a sense to, to vision in general. And it's certainly a, a good example of object recognition. Um, so just in, in general curiosity, scientific curiosity, um, people started working on um, computer vision based uh, facial recognition, uh, along sometimes with with colleagues doing human vision, uh, doing neuroscience. Um, and it, in some cases, just to kind of address the question where people would say, well, computers might be able to play chess, but they can't do X, you know, they can't do other human like things, like recognize a face. So people, you know, in the very early days took that as a challenge and, and said, well, you know, maybe they can and let's actually try it. And so people tried lots of different uh, ways uh, in the early years to do face recognition uh, research in terms of 2D oriented very early work. Um, this um, slide here, this picture here is from Takeo Kanade's work in the early 1970s, which is one of the earliest, most influential works, but then other works as well. So a lot of different approaches over the years. Um, and then companies began to say, well, we, we should be able to commercialize this. Uh, there, there's probably a need for it. There seems to be progress. So let's let's try to commercialize it. And basically for a, for a long time, and particularly in the early to, to mid to late 1990s, there are a number of companies beginning to commercialize face recognition hoping for markets to emerge in this technology, thinking that there would be markets in security, building access, things like that. Um, but it was really a tough time. The technology wasn't really that good um, and the market really wasn't big enough. So it was, a, it was a bit of a struggling time for that field. But then something happened uh, uh, pretty soon after that that changed changed things a lot. And that was the, the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Uh, this really brought new urgency from the federal government in the US and many other places uh, to looking at technologies like automatic facial recognition um, in order to help with uh, border security and, and such things. Um, so funding increased significantly after this event. Um, and other sorts of applications for face recognition followed suit. So for more local uh, surveillance and security, for police departments, for casinos, for check cashing machines, all kinds of things. So this actually pushed the, the need and the desire and the funding uh, for both research and development in face recognition pretty significantly. And then uh, some years later, there was another event in the US that was, I think, also 
quite significant in continuing to push this forward. And this was uh, a bombing that took place uh, in the Boston Marathon in 2013, so about eight years ago, which killed some people and wounded many people. And this was a situation where um, face recognition actually could have been of, of significant use. And this was actually shown in a study by researchers at Michigan State after the fact. And they, they showed how current face recognition systems at the time could have actually done a good job in helping to um, uh, figure out and, and find these suspects here. So this was just another thing that helped push the, the desire and the, and the need and very much the funding uh, sources in the US for, for this technology. And then time went on and um, over the years, there's been a lot of progress. So as, as I, I suspect that many of you know, um, particularly over the past, uh, you know, about seven years or so when, when the deep learning phenomenon has really pushed things forward in artificial intelligence um, very much, face, face recognition has, uh, has advanced a lot. So um, old techniques are, are not used so much and, and things like uh, this Facebook's deep net for face recognition and things like that are the state of the art and, and doing quite well in, in a lot of cases. Um, so in addition to people doing research and development and building applications of face recognition, there have been other directions of interest uh, quite different from this. People in um, non-technical subjects, so people studying science policy, various humanities subjects, uh, people studying ethics. Actually, for quite a while, there's been a lot of overlap between these scholarly interests and new technologies coming around. So things like nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, cloning, stem cells, things like that. And a lot of this over the years has at least hinted at AI kinds of technologies. And in recent years, a lot has been discussed uh, by the scholars in these various areas about face recognition technologies. And these questions always come up in these sorts of discussions with people from humanities and sort of different society viewpoints. What are the responsibilities of individuals, of companies, of governments, of society in general, when these technologies come about and both for good and for potential bad. Um, so it's really interesting, I think, to have these discussions, these sort of interdisciplinary discussions with both people thinking about the technologies and people thinking about other aspects of them and societal implications and such. One of the very well-known examples of this is the book 1984 by George Orwell, um, which you know came out many, many decades ago. Um, and this book is constantly brought up in people who talk about ethics of AI and of face recognition as, as sort of a comparison to the present day situation or the concern to where we might be going with these technologies. And there's a significant concern uh, or fear of this Orwellian dystopia of mass surveillance and, and, you know, a sense very powerful governments taking advantage of their citizenry with these sorts of things. Um, and also these discussions don't just take place in a vacuum. They're also informed by other things going in, going on in society. And the general and environment of these other things includes um, these many kinds of data breaches and, and other sort of ethical issues and debates we've been having for years now related to security and privacy of data, related to unemployment due to technology, related to inequality that sometimes technology seems to broaden, um, bad or hazardous online behavior like bullying, um, all, all kinds of things that, you know, not just face recognition, but technologies over the years have brought up lots of issues that have concerned, you know, people for, for various reasons. So it's a, it's a general environment where there's sort of an increasing amount of, of distrust or, or perhaps a de declining trust around the world and, and uh, around technology sectors even. Uh, distrust in government, police, news media, and other institutions, and of course, the technologies themselves. So it's, a, it's just an interest, interesting place that we are in. Um, and 
this is just the context of these face recognition discussions. So now let me jump back into face recognition in particular. There have, of course, been a number of really specific things in recent years pointing to problems, errors, bias, things like that in face recognition systems. I want to just kind of kind of quickly run through some of them. I, I won't go through all of these, but I'll mention a few of these of, of the many sort of well-known publicly things that have come about in recent years. Um, so for example, this first one, uh, about six years ago, there was this flaw in Google Photos that turned out to be very embarrassing and, and very kind of bad, where they labeled photos of some black people as gorillas. Um, you know, a very bad thing, obviously, for, for a company to do. And, it was, it was, of course, a mistake, but it sort of pointed out um, what kinds of effects there can be, even in, you know, not that important applications. It's not a high security thing, but it's something that lots of people see and, and can certainly have various implications to, to make this kind of bad mistake. Um, uh, also, several years ago, there was a company called Faceception that claimed to score facial images using personality types like academic researcher, brand promoter, terrorist, pedophile, to be able to sort of predict behaviors based on just facial images. And there's a lot of uproar about, you know, that someone even doing that or claiming that it could be done successfully or, or even wanting to apply that kind of thing. Um, in 2018 was the now famous gender shades paper that came from a group at MIT showing uh, disparate performance in commercial face recognition systems across classes of gender and skin color. Um, and, and that was really important in terms of uh, letting a lot of people know, especially in the general public who hadn't thought about this much, that there's some pretty significant issues in, in bias in these sorts of systems and maybe in other kinds of AI systems as well. Um, Let's see. So uh, there are several other things. I'll, I'll mention uh, the ACLU used Amazon's facial recognition system in 2018 to do a test where there are lots of errors and kind of embarrassing errors where members of the U.S. Con Congress were incorrectly matched with uh, people in an arrest, arrest database. Um, let's see what else. Uh, there have been accounts of a few specific accounts of people in the US, African American people in the US being wrongfully arrested, where facial recognition systems were used, at least at some point in the process of wrongfully arresting these individuals. And that's a pretty big deal to actually arrest somebody, throw them behind bars, whether it's for a short period or, or, or longer. Um, and these have, have um, generate a lot of concern and interest. Um, these are the three men in particular, and, and I think it's actually quite important to think about the individuals in situations like this, what they went through and, and the effect of these kinds of technologies um, that they could you know, be doing this kind of thing to, to lots of people unfairly and, and um, in quite uh, disparate ways. Um, we can talk about sort of the numbers and, and, and you know, what's, what's the good they do as well as what's the bad they do, but I do think it's important to acknowledge these kinds of significant um, problems. Um, other studies that have uh, claimed to correctly classify things like political orientation from face images, um, Uber drivers claiming that the companies uh, uh, being racist against them based on facial recognition software. Uh, in recently, Facebook having to apologize after another bad labeling um, problem with their images. Um, so a bunch of things. Uh, and then also along with these sort of specific incidents over the recent years, a number of data sets and face recognition systems have been decommissioned recently because of these, these uh, serious concerns that have been raised. Uh, so for example, Amazon, Microsoft, and IBM have all announced pauses or halts on their development or the, and or their marketing of face recognition technologies. Um, New York lawmakers have passed a moratorium on the use of certain face recognition in schools. Uh, UK Court of Appeals has halted uh, use of a system. Um, down at the bottom here are five widely used uh, uh, face recognition related databases that have been taken out of commission now over these sorts of concerns. Um, and, and 
uh, let's see, some other company action. So uh, in early 2019, Google said they wouldn't sell their face recognition te technology, at least under for a while under certain circumstances. Uh, again, IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon have all made significant changes. And then most recently, just about a month ago, Facebook announced that it's shutting down its face recognition system and deleting uh, billions of face recognition images or, or signatures as part of a company-wide movement to limit the use of these sorts of technologies in their products. So a lot of interesting company actions um, f following a lot of this uh, sort of public discussion and to some degree outrage about face recognition, face recognition technologies. Um, an important thing to think about here, though, uh, these companies like IBM, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, they they have made a lot of uh, public announcements, gotten a lot of press about these. But in fact, they're not the companies that really are used mostly in, in most of the uh, deployed facial recognition systems. It's really mostly companies that you may have heard about, like NEC, you, you would probably know about. Um, but a lot of these you might not even have heard of. And, and these are companies that are really doing Doing most of the heavy lifting in terms of implementing real working face recognition systems in various contexts. So Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, Facebook, they might be getting good PR at little damage of, of not using these things, not selling these things. These are the companies that really make a difference, but we haven't heard those kind of announcements from, from these companies, which is, is you know, interesting. Um, so uh, another interesting situation is this company that you may have heard of Clearview AI uh, Clearview AI a couple of years ago was sort of a sort of a stealth startup company uh, not many people knew about and then in early 2020 reports began to surface about what they were doing they're essentially a company that's doing Google for face images so you you know can input a face image and back to you comes all this information about the person you input and they have good technology they, they have uh, done a very good job of, of matching faces and scraping the web all over the place with lots of data and being able to come up with a large amount of data from a given query face. And um, there's a lot of concern about how that has been used and, and especially how it might be used. Um, there's also been stories about the misuse of their technology by their users, by their investors, by their friends. Um, and for many people thinking about this company, Clearview AI, and what it's doing in the face recognition space has been sort of an aha moment. That is, they, they look at this and they say, well, I don't know if it's illegal or not, maybe it is, but it feels very creepy. It feels something that I don't want uh, to be happening. Um, and, and so it has raised a lot of concern and, and helped fuel, I think, some of the very significant um, outrage or, or protests or whatever against, against uh, face recognition technologies. Um, so back to things like uh, the law enforcement use of face recognition technology, um, there is both push uh, from various organizations throughout the world, and, and especially I know in the United States, in terms of border security, in terms of police, in terms of FBI, and, and similar things, because many of these people see how these technologies can be effective and can help them catch uh, thieves and terrorists and criminals and such. Um, at the same time, there have been local and, and state level and in some cases national level bans for police and, and other organizations using these technologies. So it's, it's sort of an interesting situation right now where these bans are being passed uh, in various places at various levels. Uh, while at the same time, the police in that same area might be saying, we need this, we want this in order to make you safe. And so there are lots of these ongoing discussions, and in some cases, sort of heads, bite, heads budding from different organizations to figure out what's the right solution here. Do we stop it? Do we regulate it? Do we just let it go, period, or what? Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about these uh, conflicts uh, in a bit. Um, and then there's some interesting uh, and concerning, at, at least, reports on China's growing surveillance state, for example. Um, and uh, 
also uh, growing surveillance in Turkey uh, fairly recently, and also growing surveillance in India. And these are just three examples. I, I'm not particularly intending to uh, pick on or focus on, you know, just these these uh, countries, but really to make the point that although crime is a significant issue and security and safety are important everywhere, um, there are also concerns in these countries and elsewhere about some of these efforts going going forward. Um, and so I think really, if nothing else, it's an important discussion for countries, for the world, for local areas to be thinking through, okay, what do we think about these technologies? How concerned should we be? How concerned are we? What are the possible ways going forward? Uh, so to kind of summarize to some degree the, the significant concerns, um, there's concerns about bias and, and, and uh, treating dif different races differently. Um, and, and different people of different ages differently, people different genders differently, et cetera. There are issues of data privacy violations and consent. There are issues of a lack of transparency and how these systems are deployed. There's lots of concerns about function creep, like they might be put in for a certain reason, but then individuals might choose to use them for different purposes without the knowledge, for example, of the citizenry or, or the uh, government service that allowed them to put it in in the first place. Um, concerns about the permanence of your face being, you know, a permanent identifier for you, unlike a card or something like that that could be changed. Um, so really lots of concerns. And at the, at the bottom there, there's still for a lot of people that sort of, it feels creepy to me. I, I'm not sure that if I, that I want this sort of thing. Um, so if nothing else, these concerns are real. These concerns are significant and they're growing all the time. And I want to summarize that. I, I just want to play uh, this video or at least part of this video Video, which is um, put together by an organization called Ban Facial Recognition. And it's really kind of put together to, to show um, what you might call a, a, an extreme or at least, you know, kind of far to one side view of, of the dangers and concerns and fears. So I think you should be able to hear my audio. Um, let me know if you can't, okay? Facial recognition is sweeping yeah. across the country. Okay. Tech companies are building it. Law enforcement agencies are using it, and our politicians are doing little to stop it. It's being used in deportations, where ICE has access DMV databases in different states to get driver's license data. People who legally signed up for driver's licenses had no idea that they would be used to deport them from the country. It's being used by police, where cops frequently misidentify people as criminals, putting women and people of color at higher risk. It's being used in our homes, where devices like Amazon's Ring feed our faces directly to the police. If you visit your friend's house, Amazon could send your photo to the cops without your consent. The police could keep your data forever, building a vast database of our movements throughout cities. Facial recognition is spreading fast, but momentum against it is growing. San Francisco and Somerville, Massachusetts just became the first two cities to ban facial recognition. Thousands of tech employees have called on their companies to stop working on facial recognition projects, warning of surveillance dangers, and politicians across the spectrum, from Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to Jim Jordan, are warning of the technology's inherent dangers to civil liberties. We're calling for a federal ban on facial recognition. It's too dangerous to be deployed on our streets and in our homes. Facial recognition could drastically change our society, transforming it into a surveillance nightmare almost overnight. Like nuclear weapons, this tech is too dangerous to proliferate. It must be stopped. Join us in calling for a national ban on facial recognition. Okay, I'll stop there. Um, so th this, this is, to me is sort of a, a good summary of that set of arguments, um, you know, that basically we should throw this out. It's too dangerous to touch. It's, you know, like, like a new nuclear weapon that it would be better not to do. I, I'm not saying that I agree with this completely. I think it's an, it's an important perspective, though, to, to consider in this uh, broad discussion about facial recognition technologies. Uh, another thing that I think is really worth watching sometime, if you're interested in getting another perspective of this, there's a comedian. I, I don't know if you know the comedian John Oliver. He's a, he's a British comedian. He has a show in the U.S., a nightly show, very funny guy, but also very insightful about politics and, 
and society and such. And he he did a show uh, on June 15th, 2020. So over about a year and a half ago on facial recognition. And it's it's really well worth watching. It's about 21 minutes long, I think. Um, and it's it's both humorous and, and informative um, and has a little bit different point of view of, of the one I just played, um, but is really worth watching, I believe, to, to get a, a sense of, of uh, his perspective on these things. All right, so having said all of that, I, I want to look at a, a little different uh, viewpoint now. So all of those concerns bring up the question, well, should we pass laws? You know, what, what should we do if we are indeed concerned, either terribly concerned or, or at least a little bit concerned about the way things might be going? And of course, there, there are lots of uh, possibilities from a legal point of view. There, there's regulation, there's bans, there's uh, moratoria. Um, and as, as I've sort of indicated, there are already laws around in various places in the world but it's very kind of patchwork, uh, covering different things, maybe covering just police or covering public areas or, or cover, covering you know, certain kinds of uses or covering the databases themselves. And, and they don't necessarily fit well. Uh, so it's really useful, I think, to think about um, these issues about who has authority to legislate in an area, in a, a topic like this. Um, what can be legislated? Can it be addressed towards government or police or companies or individual use or what? What, what are the appropriate tools, regulation, banning, moratoria, penalties? Um, lots of interesting discussion uh, in recent years about legal aspects of these things too. Um, and so just as an example in the US, there are all these different city bans now, uh, and again, banning different things, police use, public use, things like that, uh, and, and new ones coming up all the time. There are state legislation. I'm going to talk a little more about the particular Illinois uh, state legislation, but others as well, and, and more coming all of the time. Um, so the, the Illinois legislation, so I, I currently live in the state of Illinois, Chicago is in Illinois, and Illinois was the first state in the United States that uh, 13 years ago um, passed this, this uh, law called the Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA. BIPA. BIPA is the oldest and strongest biometric privacy law in the United States, and it covers retina, iris, fingerprint, voice, hand, and face biometrics to some degree. Um, and it basically requires companies doing business in, in Illinois to comply with certain requirements. Um, and as it turns out, uh, it's a little problematic from my perspective and, and from many of the company's perspective, because I think it's not written entirely clearly, especially for face recognition. It uses these terms like biometric information, a biometric identifier, scan of face geometry, uh, some of which are not really clearly defined or obvious from a technical perspective of what that means. And particularly, it, it, it defines biometric identifier as a retina or iris scan, fingerprint, voice print, or scan of hand or face geometry. So in the, in the case of face recognition, this scan of face geometry is the phrase that actually matters here. Well, does a certain face recognition product do a scan of face geometry? Sometimes that's not so easy to answer. And I kind of suspect they didn't have um, you know, really qualified technical people at the table, at the discussion, when they, when they sort of came up, came up with a specific wording of this legislation. Um, so this has turned out, turned into many different lawsuits, and uh, by far the most well-known one is a lawsuit against Facebook that uh, happened over several years and was uh, finally settled over the past year. Facebook has to pay 600, is in the process of paying $650 million to various people because of this. 
Um, and it turns out I was actually involved in this lawsuit uh, in, in terms of technical expertise and, and making opinions on various things. Um, so I got to talk to various lawyers and others about how face recognition works, what a neural network is, what deep learning is, um, what image alignment is for faces. Um, does these, do these systems do a scan of face geometry? Uh, what's the difference between a holistic based feature or a fee holistic based approach or a feature based approach, all these kinds of interesting technical issues. Um, but they're, they can be pretty uh, complicated when you're talking to lawyers and trying to look at, you know, real legislation about so I actually found it quite interesting. Um, and, and so, again, there, there's legislation coming up all the time in the United States and including federal legislation. So in, in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, nothing has been passed yet at the federal level, but there are thing, a number of things in the works. Um, you may have heard uh, this year about the Artificial Intelligence Act in the European Union, and that's sort of a broad ap approach to AI, to, to approaching AI issues and concerns about about safety and all with AI issues. And they've taken, a, taken an approach of, of sort of this triangle here on the right, where there are lots of things that aren't too risky, a smaller number of things with limited risk, fewer things with high risk, and then presumably a fairly small number of things that are just unacceptable risk and saying, we just will not allow these things in, in the highest uh, group there. The high risk group are the group of things that need to be regulated or watched over very carefully. As it turns out, face recognition technologies are in that category for the EU's Artificial Intelligence Act. So I'm very interested to see how this is going to play out over time with this fairly new act that by itself uh, is not you know, legislation in any given country. It's sort of guidance at this point. It's non-binding, but I suspect that this will become legislation in various formats um, in your, some European countries. So really everything I've said so far is really just kind of to, to make the point of this slide here, that um, all of these perspectives on face, recon face recognition technologies, technical issues, legal issues, ethical considerations, policy matters, they're all a balance. And they all balance on top of various cultural and society norms and expectations, which I believe do change quite a bit from area of the world to another area of the world, from country to country, from in the US state to state or from city to city or whatever. Um, and, and so I think it, it's it's a good reason why there, pe why there need to be not just technologists or not just legal people or policy people, but also ethical people, humanities people, history people at, uh, at the table when these kinds of discussions are going on and when societies and groups are deciding on legislation for these important things. Um, so there are groups, of course, that influence those sorts of legislation or, or influence the, the lawmakers or try to. There are various professional groups, including, for example, uh, in the ACM for uh, computing. There are various industry groups. For example, there's a group called the Partnership on AI, which includes a lot of companies you, you would know quite well. There are companies themselves, companies like Microsoft, who I actually think has done a pretty good job in putting forward principles for face recognition and for artificial intelligence ethics um, that I think are pretty well done. Um, there are various civil liberties groups, especially in the US, the ACLU, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and others, and then other lobbying groups like this one I mentioned earlier, the bandfacialrecognition.com, but others. And, and all of these sorts of groups come from different perspectives, but I think they're all, again, important to be in the conversation so that the society is really kind of appropriately represented in these important discussions. So again, I mentioned this one earlier, just wanted to put the website up there um, to if you want to go check out, you know, what what they're saying. Um, but, you know, they're really kind of treating face recognition technology like a new nuclear or biological weapon and treating it very seriously in terms of the, the reaction. And, and they're obviously very much in favor of banning 
face face recognition face recognition technologies is that the only solution solution i don't think so but again i think their perspective is important and should be included in this discussion so we have this ai technology that's good getting better all the time um, but there are lots and lots of concerns about what it can be or is bringing about um, and you know it's it's a important question is it ushering in a dystopian orwellian mass surveillance state in society or is it doing good things or or in some sense both and if so how can we balance those kinds of things and if i just feel creepy about it well is that enough to to ban it or or something like that or should i really think through why i might feel creepy and and maybe do a more systematic analytic way of balancing you know pros and cons and benefits and dangers and such and you know an important question is when might it be too late to make certain decisions you know letting the cat cat out of the bag for example and also who actually is deciding this you know is is it the people who scream the loudest or is it the people who sit down and thoughtfully think through these issues and, and have the right people around them and form them properly um, and weigh the pros and cons of various solutions carefully? Should we all burn it all down, which is a phrase that John Oliver uses quite often in, in his video that I mentioned before, or should we think it through in, in other ways? Um, and here again is just a push for the John Oliver segment, which, which I think is really, again, uh, interesting to, to watch uh, in this context. So all of this is, is getting for me to a technical question, which, okay, given all of that, still, what can technologists do? What, for example, can a PhD student do who's really interested in these areas and looking for uh, a dissertation topic that might have some impact uh, both in the societal issues as well as, you know, the technical interest that person has. Um, and, and something that I think is really important here is that, you know, the old maxim that the weakest point of a chain, a chain is its weakest link. Um, and I think face recognition technology is, is always in the context of a system. Um, one of the key questions is where are the weak points of that system? Are humans involved in that system? Are they involved enough in that system? Um, is a system making fully autonomous decisions that can have terrible consequence? Or are humans involved in appropriate ways when there's a significant consequence that might happen? Um, and these are kinds of things that I don't think have been thoroughly enough considered. And in fact, there are a lot of directions of research that do think about systems engineering issues, that think about the data privacy issues involved in this, that, that think about the bias of particular data and particular algorithms, um, that how humans and AI systems can work best together and how they tend to influence one another. There are really lots of questions that have significant technical elements but also can inform the broader discussion or, or at least uh, help in the broader discussion. And so I, I really am trying to push to some degree the kind of systems engineering approach to face recognition technologies where we're really thinking about the full system, not only the specific technical piece, the, the algorithm, the data, whatever, but how it is actually used in, in real systems. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that includes a lot of things that really the bottom line of a slide like this is that there are all kinds of uh, PhD dissertations, research topics, funding projects uh, that are still possible. And there are conferences that have been popping up in, in recent years about fair, fairness in AI, fairness in face recognition and things like that. Um, so it, it's really a, a fruitful area, I believe, for technical researchers, but then also for their, their colleagues in social science in policy, in psychology, in other areas to think through a lot of these issues. Um, since I tend to be a, a, a interdisciplinary person, this, this kind of excites me that there are all these areas that are important to society now and I think are important for interdisciplinary, wor interdisciplinary work to be pushing forward. Um, so it's also, of course, important to engage the policymakers, the practical people, the governments people, the company people who, who do things. Um, but again, going back to the researchers, I think it's, it's really good for us to be thinking always, what are the social consequences of my work? Um, are there 
potential cost to the things that I'm doing? How can I engage in a broader conversation about these sorts of things? Um, so what can face recognition and more broadly AI researchers do? Lots of things. Just to mention one, for example, the NeurIPS conference uh, in 2020 last year, and this is the biggest conference in machine learning. Um, for the first time, they required that people who submit papers to their conference uh, address ethical concerns and potential negative outcomes of their work when they submit the paper. Uh, this may not be the exact right solution or something that every conference has to copy exactly, but this sort of thing I think is a really positive positive step forward. And, and we'll figure, you know, what the best thing is. We'll figure that out over time after some trial and error. But it's really encouraging to me that not only this, but other conferences are starting to look at um, really more deeply integrating the, these thoughts and questions uh, about ethical concerns and, and possible consequences um, in, in the research for the researchers doing this kind of work. And, and I think there are other ideas like this that, that, can, um, that we can be thinking of and, and implement over time. Um, and, and, you know, bottom line, in my view, uh, researchers should be introspective to some degree and ask questions to themselves, again, about their work, their position about this, are there opportunities for them to connect with other disciplines, other people? Um, are they thinking through the, the responsibilities of themselves, their group, their, their profession, um, their research community, uh, the, the community and society as a whole? Um, and just as a pragmatic matter, matter, there I think is increasing amounts of funding for people doing interdisciplinary projects in things like this. So I think there's kind of a practical motivation as well, um, as well as the kind of you know, ethical and human motivations for this kind of thing. So really just taking you through these various thoughts of these technologies uh, you know, over the last uh, 40 minutes, I just wanna end with uh, um, almost end on, on this slide, which is a quote from Rod Brooks. I don't know if you know who Rod Brooks is. He, he's a very famous uh, former MIT professor who worked in robotics for many years at MIT. Um, he started he started many successful robotics companies, um, and he had he published this quote uh, la or earlier this year that said just about every successful deployment of AI has either one of two expedients: it has a person somewhere in the loop, or the cost of failure should the system blunder is very low. So, in other words, he's saying if the cost of failure of a system is high. If there are potentially, you know, very negative consequences of failure, humans need to be in the loop. I think the only question with these technologies, including face rec facial recognition technologies, is where and how humans are in the loop. It doesn't necessar necessarily mean that every face recognition decision has to have a human approving it or something like that, but the, the role of humans needs to be in, uh, in the system needs to be considered from the very beginning, I think, not just an afterthought. Um, and the cost of failure in, in many of these applications can be very high. And so I think it, it's incumbent upon researchers, uh, um, engineers, developers, and everybody really in, in the loop to, to be thinking about these questions. So in summary, um, I think facial recognition still has a lot of promise. I think there are a lot of important positive applications, really good things that face recognition can do and has done for society. But I believe the fears uh, raised, the concerns that some of these groups like ban facial recognition uh, raises, they are significant and, and they're not to be ignored. And, and I do not think, at least for me personally, it's, it's okay to say, well, I just do research. That's not my consideration. I think it is my consideration as, as being a human, basically. So there are various levels of responsibility uh, for research for developers, for deployers, um, personal, corporate, community, global responsibilities. And I think in terms of academia and, and actual you know, coursework for students and all, just adding a course in ethics might be a very good thing to do, but it doesn't really address uh, deeply the issues here. I think we need to go beyond that in our, in our academic programs. Um, I don't think personally that either extreme, you know, face recognition, face recognition is just terrible, burn it all down, disallow it, period. I don't think that extreme is 
good. I also don't think the extreme that, oh, don't worry, these things aren't so bad. I don't think that extreme is good. I, I think, you know, we really need to take those seriously and think through these things deeply. Um, so a thoughtful, well-informed combination of technical policy, regulatory approaches, ethical considerations, societal concerns can make a huge difference. There's plenty of common ground and, again, plenty of opportunity for people to work together uh, in interdisciplinary endeavors. So that's really what I wanted to say. I wanted just to kind of guide you through that wide uh, range of thoughts and opinions and, and situations. Um, so thank you for your attention. And if we have time for questions, I'll be happy to take some. Well, thank you. Thank you, Matthew, uh, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation and lots of insight indeed. Uh, I hope that uh, it will help uh, all of us uh, to move further and think uh, differently on some topics as well. Uh, now we have uh, Dr. Onirban Bandhubadhai from NIMS Japan. So he is one of the session chairs. Um, so uh, he will uh, handle that QA session. So Onirban, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you. Time, uh, so enjoy. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Matthew, for the wonderful talk. And then it was really interesting. Uh, so before we uh, take the questions, uh, uh, what are, uh, there must be definitely lots of questions. Uh, uh, Atikur, uh, could you please select a few, a few questions? Uh, okay, I um, mean, uh, uh, people can uh, write on the chat box, otherwise raise hands so that we can allow them to ask questions, but I have many questions. So uh, if no <laughs> questions, so, uh, <laughs> I'm willing to so I start. Yeah, I start with the first one. So the point is that regarding the bias and racist issue, I thought about it before uh, as well, that uh, the number one reason we understand that the data set is biased towards uh, one race or one kind of things. So that is one of the reasons, but any other reasons that uh, I mean, uh, uh, fails the technological part. Like, I mean, one race is difficult to recognize even though the data set is larger, something like that. Uh, so is there anything technical? Because we know that in China, they have huge data sets and they are much more successful. And uh, in terms of, I mean, uh, face recognition based policing or whatever you mentioned, China has the highest amount of surveillance cameras in the world and uh, they track and everything they do. And as it's a one nation, so it's very easy to track because, I mean, the data, city, data cities, I mean, are not diverse, are mostly mm -hmm. one dimension. So in that regard, just can you give uh, some insight whether there are technical issues or how to move forward to avoid the biasness, you know, or especially on a specific race, uh, which we found, I mean, recently, uh, rigorously. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so it's a good set of questions. And, and I think it's complicated, actually. And, and I think it's more complicated than many, than is often described sort of like in the public press and such. Uh, I, I think that, you know, biased data sets are are kind of obvious, right? You know, that that's a clear thing that in some cases has been extremely imbalanced, um, you know, because the people making them, especially in the early days of facial recognition, didn't really think about that issue. They're just trying to see if it could work, you know, and, and come up with ideas for algorithms and stuff. They weren't really thinking about practical deployment and, and such issues. Um, but unfortunately, people kept not thinking about those questions, you know, for a very, very long time. Um, and, and so these, these these data sets, not just in face recognition, but in all kinds of applications of, of AI, um, are, are quite often biased. But, but it, it then begs the question, what does the right data set look like? In fact, that's not a very clear, there's not a very clear answer to that question. Um, it's, it's still sort of a complicated set. Uh, for example, when the actual population is not evenly distributed among various demographics, you know, whether you think uh, 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 sex, race, age, you know, all kinds of ways in which we vary, what's, what's the ideal data set for a situ situation like that uh, in training? That's not even clear necessarily. And in fact, if the demographics, you know, shows a certain distribution, is the right thing to have a data set 
that mirrors that distribution or is the right thing to have a data set that makes them all equal um, if it's the latter then maybe your training is better but there might actually be unintended unintended consequences of trying to get more data from smaller populations um, than, you know, relatively speaking, than the amount you get of the larger populations. And in some cases, it could mean, you know, especially going to sensitive groups to ask for their data, which causes other kinds of, you know, concerns and issues. So, so it's a complicated situation, I think. There's also sort of what I think you were alluding to, I think more fundamental algorithmic or, or you know, maybe even in some case physics based, um, or at least the combination of sensing and physics based issues. Um, cameras are sort of well known to have been developed primarily for a certain range of skin tones and and they're they're kind of fine-tuned in terms of their uh, electronics you know especially sort of consumer level cameras and professional cameras um, and those you know are better for some skin tones than other skin tones um, and so they produce fundamentally images that have less dynamic range for certain kinds of faces than for other kinds of faces. Um, so there are technical solutions to that, I believe, but not all obvious technical solutions of, of how you do that well. Um, and it may just be the case that certain kinds of information are uh, sort of have a lower dynamic range and when they're represented, you know, in, in certain ways digitally, and so are going to lead to lower recognition rates for some kinds of faces, you know, or, or in other AI applications, some kinds of um, groups of people or groups of data or whatever. So anyway, this, this is all sort of long winded to say it's a complicated project, uh, pro a question, a set of questions, and I, I think there's definitely good prospects of moving forward and, and improving things. But I think it's actually a long, uh, a long endeavor, a long project to sort of incrementally push forward, you know, make the database data, data better, make the algorithms better, come up with better, you know, generative uh, algorithms to produce good synthetic faces for training and various kinds of things, understand the physics better than we do. Uh, and maybe you know new new ideas that none of us have thought of yet. I think there's still a lot of work to be done to get to this sort of ideal that we'd like to have of eliminating you know those kinds of of biases and inequities. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Oniba. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we have a question uh, from the audience. Actually, uh, two questions. But uh, your uh, Matthew, your comment. Uh, have already already included one question where uh, one person suggested about light and then the camera role of camera. You have nicely uh, addressed that, so I'm not getting into that question. So and another question is um, uh, from Muhammad uh, Asaduzzaman. Uh, liberty and security are always conflicting issues and need to be reconciled by adopting appropriate regulations for a better society. Since if RT is not error free. We can take FR as a prima facie evidence subject to corroborative evidence. So they want a com he wants a comment. I repeat the question. Since FRT is not error free, can we take FR uh, as a prima facie evidence subject to corroborative evidence? So this is the this is the question. If I've got it, or I need to repeat. Um, yes, yes, I've got it. Um, yeah, and, and I think it's an important question that that is sort of at the core of, of a lot of the things I was commenting on, you know, and really kind of, in a way, that question is what leads me to have the opinion I have that humans need to be in the loop uh, more and more as the con the possible consequences of a decision get larger. Um, and so, yes, uh, face recognition is not error free, um, except in, you know, the most, most trivial situations. And so if a, a decision by a face recognition system is going to be linked to some action, if that action is, you know, just how your game plays with you, then maybe that's not such a big deal. Fine to be, you know, completely 
no humans in that loop. Okay, but if that decision is lead is possibly going to lead to someone to be arrested for someone to be arrested, or for a system to call a, a black man a gorilla, or you know something very significant like that, then there needs to be humans built in, you know, human interaction in some sense. How that works specifically, I think, again, depends on the severity of the potential negatives um, and depends on, on the system itself and, and other issues like is it a real time system or not. You know, for example, in policing, there, there tends to be a lot of opportunities for non real time human reviewing of things um, in other scenarios that might have to be done in real time or close to real time it might require other solutions you know for example just if nothing else a much higher threshold in order to determine you know confidence that it's a face recognition match but more complicated things as well um so anyway in terms of this question i, I completely agree with the framing of the question um, and i think the real uh, challenge here is how do we then combine these things, take the evidence of the face recognition system, which if it's built well, can provide good and useful evidence, just like a person can provide possibly error prone, but still good uh, subjective uh, uh, opinions about things. How do we best merge these various sources of information to come to a confident decision that we then can go act on, depending on how seriously that action is? So hopefully that addresses the question um, to at least some degree. Okay, so I think we would like to uh, okay, ask okay. a question. So uh, I would as there is yeah. um, no other question, so I have another one. So this is a bit more technical again. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we know that deep learning is uh, flourishing extremely high, especially face recognition. But uh, if the data set is smaller, say we are working on autism and uh, autistic children and their face study and so on. Mm -hmm. On that case, uh, don't you think that the handcrafted features, classical features uh, still have some life or totally dead? Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, or for example, a, the skeleton based, yeah. like, I mean, uh, uh, some of my works are related to skeleton based human activity recognition where the data is smaller, healthcare applications. So I find that uh, deep learning is not that much suitable, rather, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, handcrafted features can be, uh, or classical features can be more suitable. So just at some point from you. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, and to some degree, it depends on what the what the application or use of it is going to be, right? Um, but uh, one alternative. So, so let's start with this. Um, I think what you pointed out is true. In, in some domains, there's just not adequate data to to train large, and you know, the deep networks are getting deeper and larger all the time, right? And requiring requiring more and more data. Um, and they're getting trained and trained better, trained better and better because of this. But, um, but yeah, some domains just don't provide that amount of data. So it might be that in those cases, you know, kind of alternative approaches, like you mentioned, uh, might be more effective. Again, kind of depending on the application. Um, but an, another approach is using things like generative adversarial networks or maybe some other technologies that can help create synthetic uh, training sets. And it, it's possible, I think, even for a, a population like you mentioned, to learn enough about that population to be able to create pretty good and useful synthetic data sets um, that could then populate a large you know, neural network trained to do the kind of tasks you want to do as opposed to you know doing another method and my my guess at least at this point is that in the long run that will be a more profitable direction because these tools are just so powerful compared to you know the way we used to do things 10 20 years ago um but in certain applications, it may actually be that the more, you know, handcrafted uh, computer vision approaches, you know, prior to the deep learning approaches um, might work and, and might work quite well. But my suspicion is that's still kind of limited compared to what might be possible with synthetic data. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just uh, one comment I wanted to know about the future. Uh, so how do we solve this problem? I was just thinking that 
Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, those people who have brown skin or black skin, they would never believe the argument that it is a technical fault because they would say that why always the black people or the brown people or the dark colored people will be treated. So it's, yeah. it, it, is, it may be intentional. So I was thinking uh, uh, how, to, how to find a solution. So could it be the solution could be that uh, instead of one camera directed from one direction, if I have three camera, and then my AI algorithms are, are creating a 3D uh, structure. And then if we, if, we, if, we, if we build a database of uh, uh, three from, from three different directions on multi-directional cameras are building, mm -hmm. uh, then, the, um, then the argument will not be there that it's a dark tone. That's why contouring or uh, I convert into grayscale. And then I, when I go for contouring, then black uh, for black face, I have very little information. For white space, I have a lot of uh, high information. That kind of argument won't be, you know, won't stand because I will have uh, three direction, three cameras, and I can create a 3D. So since you right. are a expert and then you have um, a global authority on particular this, um, uh, is it possible to, to go for this kind of uh, technology where we can permanently resolve this issue? Uh, yeah, th there are still issues though. So um, as you may know, there has been a good bit of work in 3D based um, recognition in general in computer vision, mm -hmm. but then also in, in computer, uh, computer uh, face recognition as well. Not mm -hmm. nearly as much work, you know, as other approaches. Um, but but the, the limiting, or at least one of the limiting factors here is that, um, you know, the canonical face recognition problem is, you go to a certain location, you get your picture taken there, and you're recognized, you know, like in a border security kind of scenario. But of course, that's not the only scenario in which face recognition is being used, or, you know, people need to use it. People are using in, in existing videos, for example, um, in, in situations where the people being watched are very far away. So too far for any at least current, you know, 3D systems to create good 3D structures from, from the face that are so far away and, and maybe some you know other scenarios. So in, in some kind of standard face recognition scenarios, what you said I think is completely good and would be quite helpful. Not that there still might be some issues about getting good 3D information, you know, from darker skin because of the way cameras are currently constructed, but but technically, you know, that can be improved. But still there are situations in which it's at least at the in the for the time being not easy to do the 3d part first but but you know there might be other methods as well so that, that's actually good for people to be thinking about okay that's one th you know one direction that that you've brought up maybe there are other directions you know yes. and for example you know things like your facial movement um you know and, and other things about you but that that's still kind of limiting but there might be other things that we're not really thinking especially, about at the moment or yeah that, that could be quite especially, useful especially temporal dynamics is definitely definitely uh, uh, very very helpful because uh, yeah. here in our lab or uh, here we work on spatiotemporal dynamics based recognition, not the static. Static is always problematic. Um, yeah. uh, and of, and of course there's also like yeah. you know non visible non visible light sensing and you know uh, other yes, yes, yes. potential approaches as well that yes, can yes, get yes, around yes. some of these questions. Yeah. Infrared infrared and the super, uh, superposition of multiple sensory system, multi directional system, and then yep. uh, yeah multiple system has to be merged to to, to yeah. bypass. And this, uh, it's, it's very multi modal, multi camera, multi -camera. <laughs> yeah, 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 multi yeah, lots yeah. of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, but again, that 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 presumes that you have control over the sensing, right? And in <laughs> um, in lots of situations, you don't. Uh, at least currently, we don't have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we Especially don't have. Especially in the right. surveillance cameras, I mean, situations it's very difficult to get uh, this kind of. I mean, when we have constraint settings indoor, it's easier. But uh, when we have, I mean, massive uh, uh, outdoor scenarios, it's very difficult. But still. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. these are, uh, I mean, possible. I have one last question because nobody is asking. Mm -hmm. So we, I would like to take this opportunity that we are using mask nowadays massively all over the world and it will continue. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so give us some suggestions for the young researchers uh, that how can we proceed on when half of the faces are, I mean, uh, not visible. And sometimes you have mask and then sunglass and hoodies then uh, you don't see anything. So these kind of things, uh, 
so give some research directions or ideas, mm -hmm. I mean, or points so that, I mean, uh, well, we can uh, move on. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, you know, I'm not sure that I have any specific insight there, except just knowing that um, a lot of people have been doing this over the past two, you know, year and a half or so, uh, tr trying to do face recognition when we're when wearing masks, for, for obvious reasons, you know, they, they want to uh, be able to recognize people in public spaces and all wearing these. Um, and there's actually been some very good successes. I, I, I believe NEC, uh, which I listed, you know, earlier is one of the companies, I think really one of the top companies providing deployed face, rec face recognition systems in lots of different places like airports and, and whatever a lot, um, spaces. I think they've gotten some very good results in um, face recognition uh, under mask wearing situations. I've has some researchers here and there. I really haven't actually been following sort of, you know, what's the the special approaches that these folks have been using to to get really good um, results with the masks, but kind of going back to your earlier question, you know, I think certainly one component of it is building deeper and large, more parameterized networks, you know, that that are trained on um, Im on masked images or images, you know, just of certain portions of the faces of the face. Um, and, and they seem to be getting quite good results. Um, but it, it's not that it's a solved problem. And, and I think there, there are a lot of different ways of masking information, you know, some occlusions that are on purpose, like wearing a mask of a certain kind. There are also the occlusions that are accidental or not on purpose. Probably during this talk, you've seen the sun or the, you know, the, the light from the uh, monitor reflecting off my glasses, for example, various things like that. Um, yeah, so these are still issues not only having to do with you know covid related masking but issues that come up in lots of uh, practical face recognition systems that are they're partly solved but they're certainly not fully solved you know people can do better than they could do some years ago but um but it's still not great. And then sort of going back to the earlier conversation about multimodal and all that, um, there are there is the possibility of bringing together uh, ear-based recognition, um, uh, iris recognition, you know, other sorts of things um, that could be helpful in more limited viewing situations as well. But again, I, I don't know that I have any great insight in, in specifically that question of where to go at the moment. Um, I would look at some of the current successes and and you know see what still is lacking and and start there and brainstorm about where could we go from here thank you thank you very much uh, uh so uh, uh on behalf of the organizers uh, i would like to thank uh, matthew for your wonderful presentation and very energetic and enthusiastic presentation and have your patience to to reply to all the queries and concerns that we that we had so um, uh, we are really grateful to you to take out, take out your precious time and to come here and then give, you, give us this um, presentation. As you know that we are celebrating uh, uh, the 50 years of uh, independence of Bangladesh and then, um, uh, and then uh, your contribution to this will be remembered by the nation as a whole. So thank you very much on behalf of the organizers and on behalf of the nation Bangladesh to be a part this celebration. Thank you so much. Well, and, uh, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And uh, congratulations on the celebration. It's really important. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I mean, by the way, Honiban is not a Bangladeshi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm Indian. He's an Indian. Okay. <laughs> he's a Bangla, Bangla speaking Indian. So, yes. Gotcha. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, from my side, I definitely thank my great friend, uh, Matthew Dirk. Uh, and uh, many of uh, us know him that he's the founder. Uh, a chair of uh, uh, International Conference on Informatics, Electronics and Vision, which is ICIEV uh, for the last 10 years. And uh, he's a world famous, highly contributing academic leader and currently the president of uh, Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago. Uh, so uh, we, if we praise him more, hopefully he can give us some Toyota previews uh, free of cost uh, in the future. <laughs> so uh, that's the thing. And uh, I'd like to invite you all uh, to submit uh, high quality chapters on a book, uh, which we are going to uh, work together, Matthew and myself uh, and uh, Richard Hartley and uh, Uppal, 
uh, it's on computer vision and applications trends and challenges. So uh, if you have anything great, so please contact with us or at least me. And finally, uh, I'd like to invite you to stay tuned uh, just after 10 minutes. Uh, we have two more uh, presentations from two legendary persons. One is uh, Stuart Russell. If you studied AI, uh, his book is the book uh, you studied. So Stuart Russell, uh, uh, from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, another one uh, is uh, our a legendary person on robotics uh, and great, great friend of mine, uh, Professor Toshio Fukuda from uh, the Meiji University and Nagoya University. And uh, we all know we voted for him last year. Uh, and, uh, I mean, two years before he was the president of IEEE, uh, first time from region 10, like uh, Asia Pacific uh, in the history of IEEE. So, uh, Toshio Fukuda is a great friend of Bangladesh as well. He visited Bangladesh several times and attended ICIV and IVPR conference. He's uh, one of the general chairs of IVPR as well. So we hope to enjoy their talk. So stay tuned, just uh, take some uh, coffee or something else. Uh, within 10 minutes, we'll uh, stay uh, and join. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew and Oniban. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, uh, Shah Professor Kaiser Kiyasen. Hello. Hello. Uh, 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 Professor Hafiz, Assalamualaikum. Uh, Waalaikum Salam, Dr. Uh, Salam. 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 Uh, engineer Abu Bakr Hanif, Chancellor I Global University USA, only yes. second speaker can handle Corbin. I want to do Juni, do Juni supplementary question, Agjun Agjun Corbin. She does set a whole of Halo Hierarchy, sir. So poor session to Apra Dujuni actually manage Corbin, but first John Kapni Colon, second John Kehotsegi, Abu Bakr Hanif, sir Colon. Abu Bakr Hanif, Mr. Abu Bakr Hanif, are you here? Have you been joined? I mean, I mean, the Dekta Bachi, sir. Mr. Hanif, sir, कोनो कारण जो तुमने disconnect हो जाए, ताहले सर, आमी आमी ताले आमी take over for बो, ठीक है सर, right sir, right sir, जी जी, thank you, बहुत बहुत शुभिता नहीं, तो लाम लोग void कोरी हैं, मतलब speaker दे जो ने void कोरी देखी होना रहा, join कर लेंगे। आपकी बात तो friend जी तो गुड़ते से आपने बांग्लादेशी हैं सर, right? आमी बांग्लादेशी हूँ, ठीक है। माने, friend जी और � no, 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 perfect. Diversity makes us happy. I'm not sure if you can't claim you're done on the tapet. No, 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 yeah, I Professor Stuart Russell and Professor Toshio Fukuda. Are you uh, in the Zoom meeting now, by now? No, no, no nobody is responding. Okay, let us wait. Mm.